Hello, I think we're live now. Uh, but not, maybe not yet. Tanya said that she'll give us. She wrote start directly to me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. But on the main link. I'm gonna check the main. We're the transdisciplinary, aren't we? No, we are the history. Oh, revi revisiting. Re revisiting history, exactly. Okay, we are on. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> okay, welcome everybody. And uh, me from Lisbon Architecture Triennale and Danica Prodanovic from uh, BINA, the Belgrade International Architecture Week. We'll be moderating this session and we're very happy to welcome the Anna, the collective uh, OASI and the collective Punt Six, <laughs> Punt Seis. <laughs> Um, Mujeres y Urbanismo. Uh, I will briefly uh, let everyone know about Lisbon Trinale project and then Itza will briefly let any, everyone know about uh, Bina's project for this year and we will then hear about each one of our uh, fellows for their ideas for this year and we'll share thoughts and a discussion. Uh, you're all very welcome to uh, pose your questions. So very briefly, we at Lisbon Triennale, we will organize, put in place the second iteration of the Future Architecture Collection briefing, which is an exhibition. And the idea is to put up an exhibition from the archive collections of the members of the Future Architecture Platform. We did that last year with uh, Sonia Lakish, 
uh, an, an emergent uh, fellow from the Future Architecture Platform past iteration, and uh, which curated the exhibition, and Diego Sologuren, which designed the exhibition, another fellow from the emergent um, in the platform. We do it in our main headquarters. It will be our main exhibition for this year. And it, it will take place in the fall. The, the, the main idea is that, that we have, although not formally constituted, there is this fictional named by us future architecture collection. It doesn't ex exist formally, but it actually exists by the joint are collections of all the members of the Future Architecture Platform, namely the Museum of Architecture and Design in Ljubljana, Maxi in Rome, the Estonian Museum of Architecture in Tallinn, the Swiss Architecture Museum in Basel, the Gulbenkian Foundation here in Lisbon, the Museum of Architecture in Wroclaw, and the Royal Academy of Arts in London. All of these members have collections, and uh, from those collections, a selected emergent from the future architecture platform this year will be curating an exhibition which is a carte blanche for that person. S some other fellow will be designing this exhibition and the idea is to generate a fresh and more comprehensive narrative based on a diversity of content as part of a larger project questioning architecture collections in general. We want to highlight the potential of the future architecture members archives our goal is to promote stronger evidence of the possibility of collaborating among platform members through the activity and creativity of the selected emergence. So we're looking for two emergent professionals or collectives from this call, one to lead the curatorship and the other to be responsible for the exhibition design. So this is very briefly what we're looking for and we're very happy to see that there are a lot of good ideas uh, within this year, among which we have three of them here. And I pass on to you, Danica, now. Thank you, Manuel. So I'm Danica Prudanovic, uh, as you already heard. I'm coming from Belgrade, from the Belgrade International Architecture Week. Uh, as as uh, Lisbon Triennale, we are part of the platform since the very beginning, and uh, we all very much believe in the good deed of this platform because it's really uh, interesting and important project uh, platform for emerging creatives, creatives all over Europe. So uh, this year it was 450 people, more than 400 people, 450 people participating in the open call and each year is more or less like that. So you can imagine it's really a big, big number of young creatives uh, being possible to present theirs, their, their and your ideas about the future of architecture uh, as people who are going to create the, the, the architecture of the future in this world. So uh, for this year, we decided to organize uh, uh, within the Future Architecture Platform Program a summer film school. Uh, it's going to happen in September. And uh, we plan to uh, research and to work uh, on on the on our building. Actually, we are situated. The Belgrade International Week is situated in the very center of Belgrade, in the uh, cultural center of Belgrade. This is our one of our premises. Uh, it's a building that was built in the late fifties. Uh, it's a modernist building. It's the final touch of the main square in Belgrade. And we would like to research the building, to research the possibilities of its renovation, but not only uh, in the materialistic way, but also to, to think more, to rethink its function, uh, the way of use and uh, its future life. So we decided this year to do it through the uh, film language. And we would like to invite uh, five fellows to participate in this workshop, in this film workshop, as uh, lecturers, as tutors. Uh, and uh, if possible, we would like to invite fellows to come to Belgrade uh, to do it uh, in person. But if not possible, we'll do it like 
we did all programs last year in this online or maybe hybrid way of organizing the, the, the event. So um, we are dealing with history, with the memory of the place, but also with the uh, rethinking of the use of the building, the surroundings of the building, the life, the future life of the building. So this is more or less what we'll do during this uh, workshop. Uh, we are also collaborating with uh, four other members from, from the platform. It's, uh, uh, as uh, Manuel also already mentioned, Maxi Museum from Rome, Copenhagen Architecture Festival and uh, Oslo Triennale. So uh, after all of our events, we also plan to organize one uh, probably online festival with the outcomes of our uh, film uh, workshops that we plan to organize uh, within our uh, within our programs and within our institutions. So this is really very shortly about our program for this year. And now we would like to invite you to present your your ideas uh, with which you participated in this open call. And uh, I think that we'll uh, start with Anne Anderson coming from Norway. She is uh, an architect, but uh, also very much into the, into the filming uh, processes, film, and the, um, the way how to experience space uh, with uh, film language. So Anna, please start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And also, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this. And it's been incredibly uh, inspiring to, to see all of the other fellows work as well. So, um, so as mentioned, I'm an architectural historian and uh, filmmaker. And uh, the project that I entered into the open call uh, for Future Architecture is um, a project that I started working with in 2017, um, but especially in 2018. Um, but it has been kind of a side project to my, my uh, day job, which uh, I'm working as a researcher at the University of Oxford, um, working on a project about people living in blocks of flats in Europe. Uh, but this side project, um, it's called uh, An Architecture of, uh, of Chronic Illness. Uh, and I thought I'll take you through um, some of the aspects of this um, project. I let, no, sorry, share screen. And we did test this, so hopefully it's working okay. Uh, so that's that's my idea, and I thought I'd take you through um, what it contains of currently. It's in development, and I think I'll continue working with this theme about architecture and chronic illness uh, many years to come because it's a very intriguing and, and, and big topic uh, to delve into. Let's see. There. Um, so the starting point for this whole project is a very intriguing site. Um, it, this is Igalo, which is a small village in Montenegro. So it's uh, quite close to the Croatian border. Um, and this site is quite special in the Norwegian context because the Norwegian government, the healthcare service have been sending patients who live with rheumatic illness. Uh, so that is uh, autoimmune illness that causes inflammation in, in joints and other parts of the, the body. Um, so the government have been sending patients for treatment to Igalo since the seventies. And this is a program that still runs. And it's a program that I've been myself a patient on for uh, four years in a row. So I also traveled from Norway to Montenegro, uh, inhabited this very large white building by the, by the sea for uh, four weeks. And then during that uh, period of time, you undergo treatment 
uh, which is a mix of uh, physiotherapy, exercise, uh, as well as more passive treatments such as massage and, and mud wraps. Um, and there has been done research then on that uh, treatment program uh, by um, uh, scientists in Norway who uh, do, their findings tells us that uh, this treatment in warm climate for Norwegian people with rheumatic illness show very good result. But it's also a matter of um, a patient's own motivation is the key to future success. It's, it's in, their, um, in their conclusion. So uh, it is somewhere you, you do travel and you, you do uh, put a, a lot of time and effort into improving your health and well-being. And uh, when I've been on this program, I think one of the things that really, really struck me is when I returned, how um, specific bodily experiences of pain and pleasure uh, and increased mobility very much was tied to the building and to the place. And how also uh, amongst myself and the other people I, I traveled with, uh, how we would speak about the place when we returned. And obviously, since uh, the government have been sending pay people there since the 70s, uh, there are other patients who've been traveling every year uh, since that, uh, since the 70s. So there's a long history of uh, a Norwegian present, a presence in this uh, village in, in Montenegro that, as a historian, really intrigued me. Uh, and then as a filmmaker, I was intrigued to see how film could be a way of engaging with, with the history of the building, but also these bodily experiences uh, uh, that the people as myself with chronic illness um, talk about and, and tell their friends about when they return and, and remember uh, upon return. So um, uh, preparing for this uh, round table and, and thinking about what I wanted to do. I, I found this image. This is from 2018. One of the first things I did was print out a lot of images from my own uh, phone, from where I've been on treatment, and also some archival images. Uh, and that was my starting point. And then from there on, I've been kind of leaping out in different directions. Uh, and the results so far has been a series of films, short films, uh, as well as written essays, and also some, some objects that I'll, I'll show you. So I'll start with uh, this uh, uh, film called uh, Architecture Beyond Sight, um, which I think should be part of this overall project. It's kind of borderline because it's a film about disability and architecture. Uh, and I like to separate between disability and chronic illness because many chronic illnesses are uh, disabilities, but not all disabilities have to do with chronic illness. So I think that's an important distinction to do. Um, for this project, it is a commissioned work by the Disordinary Architecture Project uh, that's based in the UK. Uh, and what they do is rethinking the way that we might think about a disabled body in architecture. And the project uh, I was uh, invited to engage with was a five day uh, summer school at the Bartlett School of Architecture, um, where uh, uh, so all of the students on the summer school were either blind or visually impaired. Um, and I think what was very intriguing about this, uh, this workshop, some of the quotes that I ended up taking, uh, including in the film that was um, uh, from some of the tutors, uh, they said that, uh, you know, you don't need to have the sight to, you know, have a, have a vision. And that architecture is about so many more things than just what we can see. Uh, they had the, the blind architect, uh, Chris Downey, uh, from the US come and lecture and, and uh, be part of this. And he lost sight at uh, adult age. 
and uh, continued his architectural practice and what he found going back to the buildings that he designed before he became blind was that he didn't pay as much attention to surfaces, to textures, to, to sound uh, that uh, he would uh, do then after uh, being blind. And it was incredibly inspiring and, and it made me really uh, think about uh, the role of disability uh, in architecture and, and also working with uh, Joss Boyce, who's uh, an architect and, and theorist and perhaps the leading theorists on architecture and disability, which he uh, urges us to, to start with a disabled body because we're used to finding, you know, uh, alternative ways of navigating space and that that could be a creative potential. So uh, the other thing, the project I wanted to, to mention is called H4Hand. Um, and uh, that is engaging a bit more with the building that is in, in Igalo in Montenegro, because uh, the site in Montenegro has been used for treatment for many years since the 40s. It's quite established. And I, I understand it was also quite established in the former Yugoslavia and uh, Tito had uh, a villa built in, in the area. Uh, and this is from, from his, his villa. Um, and um, the the big kind of strange thing you see at the lower end is a fish tank, and this was one of Tito's security systems to make sure that uh, he wouldn't be poisoned. Uh, this was uh, a tank with fish, and the water would go through there. And if the fish would die, then you know they would ring an alarm bell and um, uh, make sure that he didn't die of poisoned water. And I think it's something quite intriguing about this little architectural structure that is to ensure the health and well being of whoever uh, inhabits the building. And then, you know, we quite often die of other causes, or health isn't uh, just about preventing. It can be like a, a game of, of cards uh, going to a, a casino where the house always wins. And this was the starting point then for this project, H for Hand. And this is uh, my friend uh, Hovar and myself playing uh, uh, cards at the rehabilitation facility, which is something you do quite often in the evenings. Uh, and this was also part of a project called Crip Casino, working with a, a, a poet in London called Abby Palmer, who did focus them specifically on these issues of of uh, chance uh, and health as a game you're forced to play. Uh, and that led to me also traveling to London and filming Abby in her, her bathroom and her talking about how it feels for her to be uh, in hot water. So this project is called uh, On Being and ba uh, Bathing. And uh, it just maybe finished the edit uh, last week, so that was quite uh, fun. Another project I did was I was quite intrigued by the um, the joints in the body and how that uh, could perhaps be understood or uh, seen as in in greater nuance uh, through um, welding and understanding perhaps architecture, uh, the joinery that's also in architecture. And, and this is quite uh, exploratory. I've, I don't know exactly where it's going at the moment, but I ended up making these metal uh, replicas of um, the boxes that my medicine came in. Uh, and this is a, a photo of that um, after also, I, I like that the, the rust kind of showed how it's it's um, affected by time. Uh, and and it, it made me think about, I mean, one of the issues we do face with that kind of chronic illness is stiffness, both in muscles and joints. And this idea of warm water affecting that, uh, I, I thought it was a nice link between the, the heating of the metal and the hardness of the metal that I want to continue developing. Uh, X for metotrexate, uh, another film, metotrexate was that medicine that I um, 
uh, was on at that time. And I started tracing, um, I started wondering, you know, what spaces, what knowledge is available to me as a patient and what spaces is available to me as a patient. So I started at, uh, as a fellow at the Film Study Center at Harvard University, I realized that the medicine I was on was made available to me because of some trials that happened at Harvard Medical School in the 80s. Uh, so I started tracing where kind of this medicine was invented and produced. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to tell you about this uh, also very recent project that has a bit of a COVID uh, take on it. And uh, it will be launched, I think, in a couple of weeks. So you're the first to hear about it. Um, it's a project called Ubehandlet, which means untreated. Uh, and it's a collaboration between myself and a uh, journalist and documentary filmmaker, Anne Silje Bø. Um, and in 2020, no uh, Norwegians travel to Montenegro for treatment because of COVID. Uh, and what we did was that we um, interviewed a group uh, of patients uh, and you can see the map is the, where they're all based. So we managed to spread quite nicely uh, around the, the country. And we interviewed them about their home, how they felt about their current home, uh, if COVID and the lockdown made them think differently about their home, how they were doing exercises still in their uh, flats and houses. And then we asked them to describe uh, the site in Montenegro and um, the result was wonderful. I think the description of this place that to, to many of them uh, felt like home, but also was uh, held this promise of uh, pleasure and less pain. Uh, there was a really, really beautiful description. So this project, all of the interviews will be put up online on the Norwegian Folk Museum uh, website. Uh, that could be then open for people to have a look at and use in research uh, or other other things. Um, also, the patient-run uh, organizations will, will use this. Unfortunately, only in Norwegian. So um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, I'll, I, I've taken you on a bit of a, a tour around the world already. So yeah, I'll stop sharing. Great. Thank you, Anna. So um, now I think we will proceed with the uh, uh, collective six, isn't it? And uh, afterwards, I, I would like everybody to, to bear in mind the possibility of asking questions and uh, also for the audience. So after the, the, this little introductory presentation, we'll go on with discussion and questions. So welcome. You're muted, Blanca. Now? Okay, thank you. And you can see my presentation, isn't it? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share our proposal, uh, the current city, and also with this incredible uh, college and panels. And I will try to be brief to leave uh, enough time to comments and, and questions. So our project is the current city, urban planning and public infrastructure for community care. Uh, I belong, uh, I, I want to start introducing my, my collective. Uh, we are Collective Puncis, we are based in, in Barcelona. We have been working more than 15 years for thinking space from people's everyday life and for uh, feminist transformation. Uh, we are a non-profit cooperative of sociologists, architects, and urban planners. Uh, we are working more than 130 cities and towns in the whole world. And I want to start my presentation also with this question. 
what is the meaning of care? Because this proposal of ideas is landscape of care, but probably uh, all of us, we have different meanings. So in, in our minds, um, the definition of care is, is quite different. So for us, uh, care are all the activities necessary to sustain life, like cooking, grocery, shopping, taking children to school, accompanying our mother to the health center, watering plants, um, and so on. And we work care, we have been working care for many years. And for us, it's important uh, to work care from a political and a feminist perspective, because the feminist movement has placed care at the center of debates on public agendas. It's important also highlight the fact that it's still mostly women who provide unpaid and um, paid care for others. For example, in Spain, the 84% of caregivers of elderly and ill people are women. Um, also, it's uh, very important to recognize that all the people we are vulnerable, interdependent, and eco-dependent. Also, that there are lack of social recognition and economic precariousness of care work. And the most important in this context uh, of um, in this forum of uh, future architecture is that urban planning, uh, urban planning that doesn't take care needs into consideration. So um, for support this this last idea, I think I, I think it's important to say that. Traditionally, public space has been linked to men and to productive and political activities. Uh, on the other side, private spaces has been assigned to women and to reproductive and care activities. Uh, but sexual division of labor and space segregation by gender still endures today. Uh, so public spaces has not been thought of uh, as a physical support for all the care activities that we carry out in public spaces, like shopping, like uh, go with children to school, uh, and so on. Um, our point of view from a feminist urban planning is that uh, we need to change priorities to place everyday life at the center of urban decision prioritizing care from an eco-feminist eco perspective, make space and cities safe for all and free of gender violence. And uh, also for us it's important based on women's everyday life experience because uh, voice of women has been um, silences um, for many years, like uh, professionals, but also in the social and political movements. So it's important to acknowledge and make invisible uh, our, their knowledge and expertise. So our proposal is the current city, which is a city uh, that allows you to take care of others, take care of us, takes care of the environment, and allows to take care of ourselves. Um, the current city is a theoretical proposal, uh, but we, for the years, not this, the last years that we have developed this concept or this model, new model of, of city, the new paradigm of city, uh, we have concrete uh, some criteria and, and proposal of this uh, current city. So um, I think it's a very, it's, it's quite complex uh, to explain all the definition of the current city. So I have thought that maybe the, the easier way to explain what means the current city is explain so, some project that we are developed for half a current city. And I want to start with this project 
that we have um, making in Barcelona in one neighborhood that is the Exemple and has been a participatory study with elderly people to place benches. So in this project, we have identified with elderly people the, uh, the, um, the mobility the, of the everyday life that, that they do. For example, to go to, to the market, to go to the uh, social center and so on. And in this, uh, and with these people uh, in different workshops, we have we have identified the place where the benches must be, no? And it's important that we have identified and defined where the benches must be uh, places. And also, uh, then we have proof, like you can see in this picture. With these same people, we have proof with like a experimentation, a temporary experimentation before the final decision of where are the benches. Uh, we have proof if this is the correct uh, place or not. Um, for us, benches are uh, very important infrastructure of care in the city because it's a basic infrastructure for socialization, for care, but also it's, it's very important for the mobility and the health of elderly and ill people. Because if there are no benches in the city, elderly people, they don't have the right to the city because they can't um, work. Um, so it's very important not only uh, place benches in the street, also, what kind of benches there are. So the second part that I want to explain, explain is the network of climate and care shelters. Um, we are developing right now this project. We have win uh, the, the 8th of March City of Barcelona Award the last year. Um, it's also a project that we are developing with the participatory method with participatory method, with uh, people, with in this case, with a group of women who who live in this in this neighborhood in Prosperitat in Barcelona, and the project that we are making or the proposal that we are making are a small urban infrastructure with vegetation, sun protection, cover, water, games, and different kind of this urban infrastructure that this small urban infrastructure, they compose a network inside the network, the neighborhood and are also connected to the public space and the neighborhood facilities. And um, this neighbor of climate and care shelters, they serve as uh, environmental shelters when temperatures are very high in Barcelona, Science May, more or less, um, as a space for social, socializing and local care for elders and children. Um, the third project that I want to explain is the Everyday Life Housing Network. This project is, um, is based in, we propose to connect different kind of uh, housing projects, for example, housing projects, uh, cooperatives, uh, squatters, uh, but also private housing. And um, all these people who live in different models or different kind of, of housing, um, they manage to gather the care, the everyday, the, the care that they have to do in the everyday life. Uh, and we do um, two, two ways to for do that. We have a hard infrastructure, like a community garden, a community kitchen, a storage, food cup, guest room, um, childcare space, and so on. But also with soft infrastructure, like a family takeaway, safe home, Bank of Time, Radar net Networks, um, and so on. And we think 
uh, in a country like Spain, where we have uh, a, some lacks of the welfare state, people has to um, self-manage cares. So it's quite important because the family and woman has to, to do the most of the time the cares. So it's very important that a community um, organize in the neighborhoods to, uh, to put together and manage together the, the everyday life cares. But it's important to have some space for do that, no? for that is this, this project. Um, this other project is uh, the Care Kiosk, which in Castellano for us, in Spanish, in Spanish is uh, El Cuidanguito. Um, it's a mobile and flexible infrastructure with fountain, toilet, storage space for games, some canopy, some pit, and so on. And it's a, a very flexible and easy infrastructure that we can put in different public spaces where there are uh, no, where there are nothing, and the people uh, need some kind of support for care and for make the everyday life activities. And the last project are the school playgrounds and school paths from a feminist perspective because um, we think that education is very important and it's very important to, uh, to show and to educate children in, from a feminist and gender perspective from um, equal values. And in this project, our um, we try to introduce uh, the idea and the value of the social corresponsibility of care. Um, so we have made some of these projects, for example, in, in the playgrounds, because in, in Spain by law, in Catalonia by law, the only infrastructure that most have a playground is a football. Um, a playground, so we have to change that for half to another opportunities in public spaces. Um, for end, I want to highlight the contribution of this current city of all these projects and its equal value to all sphere of life, not only highlight and prioritize the productive and the capitalist model, a social value of the unpaid work. Care should be a social and public responsibility, not only by women. Breaking public and private barriers to everyday life development. Urban design, health and well-being implications and making women visible in public um, spaces. So thank you very much. Thank you, Blanca. We should uh, now move to uh, Oasi. I don't know who, if you will all speak in a chorus or if you'll speak one by one or <laughs> let us know how you do it. I will speak and also my, my colleagues will support me if, if they think they need to, to do it. So it's, it's a honor to, to share this conversation, this space with, with these talents, with, with Anne, with Collective Unsis, and also to be moderated by, by you, Manuel and, and Danica. Um, we are not a collective, but we started as one uh, in our master, habilitating master in, in the School of Architecture of Bayes. Um, it was our last project uh, from the academy and also the first um, as professionals. We started at that master. Uh, we, we joined us um, with, with also Sergio, which is not here. He's in, 
in San Sebastian. And in, in that master, we, we prepared a, a project that finally um, has been constructed in, in Sayen de Llobregat. And we will try to show you the, the process because we think it's a, it's a project that doesn't end after the construction. Uh, it, it starts after the construction. Um, it's a natural process. So uh, we will show you um, how the, the project is and how is it looking now. Um, I will share uh, the screen. Okay, so um, OSG uh, is the renaturalization of a strongly transformed area um, with a past industrial um, elements as uh, Fabrica Bella or Torre del Gas or Calcarrera, which is part of uh, Fabrica Bella. And um, the main fact, an um, important element is the River Llobregat that has lost uh, his relationship with uh, the same town. So uh, we do a real transformation of the territory with natural logics that permits the resilience of the landscape uh, through the passage of, of time. So um, the main task was uh, a job um, asked by the town hall of Sayen, which was a uh, at, at who, to who um, gives to the master of um, a school of architecture in Bayes. And in that sense, uh, it was a real job with a real client and in real time. So um, the town was searching for the rearrangement of the margins of Rio Llobregat Giver in his uh, passage through Sayen. And in that sense, uh, we um, respond with a renaturalization of of this of this area, um, then um, the fluvial space it's recovering um, his place in the in the landscape. Uh, there's a river who crosses the town, but its presence is ignored. So um, it's a place that has lost uh, the value of the industrial patrimony uh, that has colonized the the fluvial space, and the relation with the nature it becomes uh, a degraded zona. Uh, and in ruins. So what we need to do is to have the, uh, the re reinterpretation of the river as a, a life element, uh, complex and dynamic, reflecting that uh, each actuation, each transformation um, in one part of the river affects all the hydric uh, structure. So if historically has conceived the river as an industrial element, and that derived in a massive uh, urbanization of the natural space, a space interfering in his ecosystem functions. Uh, in that context, um, that is like warming uh, the, the new climatic conditions, we need to assume our human scale, accepting the natural logics and recovering from the respect and the empathy to the nature, the place who belongs to the river. So in that sense, uh, we found out a place that it's full of um, species who, who are colonizing the, the margin, uh, blocking the natural development of, of the, the area. And also there are elements that um, blocking this connection with the new neighborhood who is growing uh, around this, this area. So the place, it's a, it's a place which is um, represented by the patrimonial past as Fabrica Bella, which is a, a very important element in the textile uh, industry, and also Torre del Gas. But as you can see, it's a, an, a scenario that uh, evokes like the past, the ruins, and, and uh, a golden epoch uh, of the industry in Sayen. And it has lost, but the relationship ha has been um, being lost, um, definitely. So in that sense, and uh, when we found out the place, we could see that the nature uh, was starting to open his own path through the pavement, was opening the path, and, and maybe um, do, do, doesn't paying uh, painting attention uh, to what was happening was uh, allowing that um, the relationship has been um, um, omitted. So in that sense, the new dialogue between the constructed uh, landscape and the natural uh, was um, interrupted by the presence of elements that is blocking and also for that uh, species that were 
um, not permitting the, the native uh, species that they must be there. So um, in that sense, um, the, the, the last square um, was um, avoiding the, the natural context and the, the benches, for example, that was say Bianca was ignoring that the, um, beside the, there is a river. Also these, these parks um, for um, of closing dogs and also enclosing kids, they were mm -hmm. not um, just showing them that the real nature is beside um, the, this, this ambit. So what we uh, do exactly, is it's the recovering of a Bosque de Rivera, which is a riverside uh, uh, forest, and converting that in an OIZ in in middle of a strongly transformed area. So um, in that sense, we understood that the reordination of the rearrangement of this of this area uh, couldn't be possible if we um, doesn't contact with experts in landscape, in engineering, in politics, and uh, etc. Who um, form and conform our uh, own ideas, but um, adding them to a um, global project. So uh, in that sense, um, the reno uh, we have uh, been done a renovation of the fluvial perception and also the collective imaginary. And OASI becomes a system that has the capacity to rediscover the spirit of the fluvial dynamics, um, giving new uses and functions to the public space that could guarantee that resilience of the urban uh, mosaic and the ecological connectivity of the territory. So the, the constant presence of the water and uh, guarantees the good um, functioning of the ecological ambit and its fertility being a, a refreshment um, refuge of humidity that stabilizes the slopes of the river. Uh, well, you are recovering that lost space the riverbank forest is acting as a transition of the limit uh, of the um, threshold between the um, constructed as, as the town and the natural. It's like a, a door between two realities. So there's um, a fluvial morphodynamic that is understood as the key of the process from the anthropization to the natural. Us, as an architect, we try to give the, uh, our last footstep um, to permit that the time could transform that into some kind of natural phenomenology. So um, we uh, started by four strategies, basic strategies. Um, this is the original form. Then we configured a um, movement of land, equilibrated and strategic respect and the floodings. And then the plantation of Bosque de Rivera um, recovers the structure um, in relation to the phreatic level, and then the engineering techniques uh, have a real consolidation of the margin, uh, stabilizing the slopes stabilized by destruction of invasory species. Bos de Rivera um, is the space that the river needs to assume these floodings. So when you are constructing, as before, in a flooding zone, you are annulling this uh, natural capacity and um, giving this danger to the, to the rest of the town. So the, modif uh, the, the modify of the topography allows to let the floodings uh, enter into, the, into our zone and retain it, recovering the originary function of the Bosque de Rivera and protecting the urbanized zone. Also, uh, as I said before, we need to collaborate with lots of experts in vineyard engineering techniques and landscape uh, professionals to understand how the river was working because that is important. The universality of our um, position as an architect is to understand the value of the rest of the professionals that they are interventing in fluvial ecosystems and through them, we learn how to act in rivers because as an architect, we don't have the, the tools, uh, enough tools to, to act in that. So we have uh, constructive techniques, uh, natural constructive techniques that is being stronger uh, a long time. In that sense, we can see a craner wall, which is uh, protecting the, the margin uh, more exposed uh, to the river. Also, 
we have uh, some rocks that protects from the erosion of when when water comes or or gets out and also we have interventions more in in older um, pavements to let them dialogue in a better way than than before not imposing architecture to the landscape and um, let um, some kind of relation more more natural relation not imposing architecture through territory to, uh, being linking territory and architecture through landscape in that sense we have this transformation from the academia to the reality one of the main things important for us is that OASI is positioned from the impact of the ecological footprint that imposed its materialization. And the place is transformed by essential interventions, uh, trying to use uh, the matter to become from the same place, avoiding the generation of residual uh, matter and reducing the external apportions. And the result, the result we previous, we preview for, for the construction um, was an, an area of 6,500 uh, square meters with a, a budget of seven, uh, 17 uh, euros a square meter. That's, uh, that means that the, the, this intervention, it's a lower intervention that could be applied in lots of places, not in the same way, but it uh, demonstrates that to build or to renaturalize, it's cheaper than everyone uh, thinks uh, of. So after the course of the, uh, our master, um, we started with the construction of the place, uh, assuming the, um, the work direction, and this is the process. First of all, we keep out the vegetation, which was invasory, to let the autochthonous species that we are planting later um, grow and develop uh, in, a sun, in, in a sane way. Then we demolish uh, some elements that were blocking the relation with the with the river. Then we replanted the reliefs. Then we have the movement, um, the land movement in a compensated way. Then we replanted the um, the slopes uh, paths. Then we applied the engineering the engineering techniques. Then we do the form work of the pavement. Also, this, this point is important because one of the things that uh, we need to assume or we need to um, maintain is that Fabrica Bella, in that sense, it's a, a very historic monument for now the town of Sayen, and there were uh, older joints in the older um, pavement. So in, in that sense, um, the nature was imposing through this old pavement that was negating this reality. So now in the new construction, uh, we are assuming that this could happen and we let the nature grow uh, along our project, not blocking them. Then we remade the, the wall. Um, we extend the plantation, the soil. We went to different nurseries to select personally one by one all the species. We extend the gravel and also we did the so in that sense, this is a fluvial scenario that the time will determine. We are not determining which will be the process. The process is alone, it's it's alone in itself, it will develop. We can see these um, photos before an important moment for us with its uh, temporal gloria. Temporal gloria was uh, a storm, a very important storm that uh, has demonstrated the power of the river. A river could be some kind of innocent uh, natural phenomenon, but when the, um, when the river gets angry, it could destroy everything in its passage. So we know this reality, um, for example, because the historical documents, for example, from 1982, uh, demonstrate us that this reality destroyed a, a small bridge um, and causes um, lots of destroy actions in all the town. So we need to assume this reality and contemplating the new project. So um, the, the things that we prepared um, works perfectly 
uh, assuming this force of the river and protecting as we think uh, in, in project. Here's the river uh, entering and the ducks has an, a new house in that sense. And after this first storm has become the first uh, impacting image. Um, before there were gravels, uh, a human improvisation image, but after the first storm, uh, all these uh, little stones and gims and all this kind of, of, of um, sedimentation are showing that with the first uh, climate uh, intervention, the first natural intervention, our, our form has been modified by the same nature. Also with, with an important mirror who um, is showing the, the real dimension of, of, of nature. The project is growing. These were the last joints. Now, spontaneously has been growing as we prepared. So now the vegetation is in his own home. And this is images from a couple of weeks ago. And this is um, to show how uh, a, a space, a public space, but also a river space could be transformed um, a long time, not just um, since construction or non-construction. This is the one of the first images. Um, you can see, you cannot see the river. Look at this guy who's Guillermo and collaborate with us in the project. He cannot see the river. And after that. Also, this is the most impacting image of transformation with the runes. Um, not seeing the river, you cannot see if there is a river or not, maybe because the chimney. also demolishing pre-existing buildings. It's difficult to recognize, but it's the same place. Yes, <laughs> these three trees. Are these here? In relation with the river, it's more clear and easy than. And this is the four of, of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I mean, thank you all. And uh, I don't know, Danica, if you have any, I have a few comments in mind. And again, I invite everyone assisting uh, in the audience to, to put any comments or questions you would like to address to any of us. And um, well, some, some thoughts came to my mind and I was also curious about if this project that you just shown is a project. Um, it's the project that you, that you selected because you thought it would fit in the care, uh, in the landscapes of care uh, uh, theme, or is the only project you actually did together um, as a as a collective? I was also wondering if Anna, uh, you were. Uh, 
because the, your approach is in, in this group at least the one the, all, all of us here you you're probably the most um poetic one the one that follows a more artistic thrive and as probably has a filmmaker more than as an architect as a filmmaker with a, an architecture background and there is something which is very strong and uh, personal in your approach, which is the fact that you have something within your body that uh, made you or led you to, to do something very specific, which was to, to think about those, that place where you, where you go. And uh, I was wondering if the rest of the body of your work, what you usually work on, is always driven by such um, personal uh, uh, information. And and Blanca, uh, I was also uh, wondering while you were talking, because your your the approach of your collective is much more systemic in a way, because you're you have this kind of I don't know if you consider yourself activists or not, but I would say a more activist uh, approach in the sense that you try, you, you were, at least from, from my point of view, you were showing us ways to correct uh, uh, things in, 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 in the streets that you think that the political decisions are not being taken as they should. So you kind of bring yourself as um, uh, proposing those corrections in your, um, in, in a very specific uh, way of thinking, a feminist way of thinking. And, and we, also, we also have a, a question here, but these were a bit my thoughts. I don't know if you, if Lanitza, you want to add something or if, or I if think you... maybe uh, fellows can um, um, relate to, to your thoughts and then uh, maybe I can ask a few questions and then we can maybe proceed with the questions uh, from the audience. Or if you guys uh, have also comments on each other's work. So maybe, First, you can uh, reply to, to this that, that Manuel says, said, and then we can go on with our discussion. Who will start? Oazi? Maybe you? <laughs> so we need to answer the question that uh, Manuel answers before, uh, asked before. Oh. Yeah, sure. OK. Yes. Um, it's our first project because, um, as I said in the, in the beginning of the explanation, um, we formed our group in the same master. And first, it was going to be it was going to be uh, an academic project, but finally ended up in, in construction. So um, the process started in 2017, and we finished that in 2020, uh, like one year ago exactly. Um, and in that sense, um, we presented this project um, because, as you can say, as white PAA uh, winners, and they offered us the, um, the opportunity to show that project in, in that session. So uh, we get profit of that because uh, we are very interested in the divulgation of the natural and cultural and architectonical values of, of itself. And we decided to, to show that project. But... Um, of course, that in our own, we have uh, different kinds of, of projects. Uh, who the client? The local company? Didn't hear you, Danica. Sorry. Who was the client of your project? Ah, the client was the town hall of Siam. And they give the, this um, an encargo. Uh, the opportunity. Yes, the opportunity was given to the master of our school. Um, the school um, was pretending to do a, a bigger intervention from one bridge to another bridge. But finally, um, because of the randomly kind of situation of this process, it's a very complex process. Um, we had the final opportunity 
to construct our project. Um, but the, the main client was the relation with um, the town hall of Sayen, also the, the ACA, which is the Catalan Agency of, of Water, because uh, we are interventing and transforming a fluvial space. So you need to have to have their confirmation. So we work with this, um, these two clients, um, the ACA and also the town hall of Sayen, and also dealing with our teachers <laughs> and, and colleagues. <laughs> But it's a, it's a very good example of uh, collaboration between the academia students and, and the local community. And the local community is the one who is going to take care of the intervention that you did. Because actually, with these uh, aggressive waters, you, you cannot rely only on the nature, but someone has to, to take care of it. And Of course. Yeah. And also, we are already taking care of that process, for example, um, Next Monday, we are going to Sayen again to talk with someone in the in the urbanistic section of the town hall, just to um, be sure of that the maintenance uh, maintenance plan that we prepare it's going to be developed in in the right way because we are very worried about um, the development of Oasi, Oasi. Uh, mm -hmm. and in that sense, we we are going to take care uh, of our project that it's like our little baby which is uh, which is born last year mm -hmm. and it will grow uh, through, through time and this is the main important thing that the architecture uh, ends the what um, start uh, when it depends mm -hmm. um but the the natural thing of oasi is that the day we finish the the obra the work um in that point it's it's burning again Burning, not burning. Before <laughs> <laughs> continuing the, the discussion with other fellows, there is a question for you. Uh, what is the role of the cultural heritage on site in your project? How would you describe the relationship between nature and culture in your approach? Okay, um, the role is very extensive because, um, as I think Edu told me that uh, before, um, the Llobregat River, it's the most anthropized river in, in Europe. Europe. Europe right. And in that sense, um, along history, all the river of Llobregat, which is crosses um, all Catalonia, um, it's anthropized and it's being used as an industrial element, which all these uh, factories position it in, in the river and takes profit of the nature. And, and in that sense, um, our positionation was um, very clear to understand how the ruins of, of this cultural heritage could be, uh, um, have been, or no, espera, um, how this cultural heritage could be um, reconciliated with the nature again. Um, before you take profit of um, river, but how you can now return to the river. So, and this cultural heritage it's, it's some kind of identity that's, mm -hmm. that has the, the people of, of the town of Sayen and these elements, which are very representative for them, uh, are a very important elements that are being um, forgiven. And, and in, in, in that sense, if you um, olvidas, que, no, or, so if you forget um, the, the identity of your town, you don't know where are you belonging from. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, we get sure that the cultural heritage uh, could be an opportunity to return to the river through them. So in that sense, uh, we have value um, that factory, that Torre del Gas, not also, uh, also not only for their architectural value, um, also for its cultural value and also the historical value. So when you and um, the people of Sayen understand how these monuments are remaining alive through the rediscoverment of the river, they uh, um, return to have importance in their minds uh, how they identificate them. So um, I think there's another part of the question. Sí. Ah, bueno, sí, espera. Um, how would you describe the relationship between nature and culture? So um, just assume that maybe the architecture in ruins has death, and when you assume that um, the rooms are dead in, in, in architectural space or in, in public space, when you understand that value 
and you understand that um, that ruined zone or degraded zone could return um, to the river, um, renaturalizing them and recovering the relationship between human nature, you um, understand how the, this, this patrimony could um, revinculate um, the, the both sides of, of the coin. Okay. Yeah. Shall we proceed? What was your comment, Manuel, on Anna's work about the personal experience? Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I would just yeah. like to add, uh, because we, have, we don't have much time. So oh. to Anna, there is, besides my comment, mm -hmm. there is also a question from Ellen, uh, which says, existing infrastructures of care, such as the one you were, lo you were looking at, are often the, the product of modernist thinking, which rarely starts from difference, as Yo's boys would say. Has your research shown any issues resulting from this? Have the spaces been appropriated or changed in any way? So, Anna. Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant question. So um, let me think what I should, I, I could start with the, the um, addressing what you said about personal, being personal in the work. And I think uh, in the past I've, um, uh, my PhD, for example, so the project I worked on before this, um, looked at the window in the life and work of Christian Norberg Schultz, a Norwegian architectural theorist, you might all know from his book, Genus Logi, Towards Phenomenology of Architecture. And that was a very, um, it started from a historical, you know, starting point. And I did introduce myself into the writing of this work. Uh, just a month ago, I signed the book contract to turn it into a book. So that will be coming soon. Um, but in that work, I do uh, build on feminist uh, theoretical frameworks to consider my own position as an architectural historian uh, following uh, one of the kind of grand old masters of, of Norwegian architectural culture. Uh, so I introduced myself, but definitely not in, in the kind of way that this project is doing. Uh, and the, the work I'm doing with Oxford for a project called Disobedient Buildings, it has an aspect of health and welfare and well-being, but in that I'm not using myself at all. Um, but I think it was something about the... Um, you know, that access you get when you're, you're thrown into a building in a situation and uh, the people you meet uh, from, you know, throughout the, the country, basically. I think to me that was incredibly intriguing. And then obviously also these, um, these buildings in, um, in, in Montenegro, as Helen is, is saying, you know, that they are... Um, modernist in, in their thinking. And uh, some of the nice things that I experienced interviewing other patients, there was one woman who talked about how she, when you come into the foyer, it's so grand, it it's, uh, has like beautiful marble floors and, and this uh, like enormous windows, uh, glass and brass uh, and uh, she describes then how much, even if she really, really loved it and she, she felt at home at this uh, place, it hurt for her to walk on the floor because it was so hard. Uh, and her describing then how it felt to walk back and forth between the different uh, treatments, I think was, was, really, uh, was really baffling to me and, and intriguing uh, and another, a way of appropriating spaces. Um, the project I did with the poet in London, Abby Palmer, uh, it was engaging with her recent most book, uh, Sanatorium. Uh, and, and she lives with disabilities and bathing and being in hot water helps a lot. Uh, but the council in London says uh, she received a, a flat with help from the council. And they said that for the flat to be accessible, she can only have a shower and not the bath. 
So she ordered uh, an inflatable bathtub from China. And the book is kind of, that's the starting point of her book. And that's where I filmed her in this inflatable bathtub, which is not working as it should. So again, you have, you know, the the architecture doesn't <laughs> necessarily, as Joss Boyce says, you know, it doesn't necessarily start from, from thoughts of difference. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, did I? Uh, and I think also, you know, your, your comment about um, me coming from from filmmaking or architectural history, I think that's uh, very true. But what I have found is when I teach uh, architecture students, uh, I find that incredibly exciting to see how, you know, talking about bodies this way or uh, teaching uh, specific filmmaking techniques such as uh, how to use voice or how to use natural sound, how to edit your film um, have, have resulted in some really, really lovely student work from architects that, that bring their design process forward. So that's exciting. Thank you. And um... There is a public question also for uh, uh, Collective Six. I would like to ask Collective several projects to present as show clearly the concern of your work to transpose the values of the interior space to the public space. We also consider necessary the trans transposition of the public space to the interior spaces. Yes, how do you project an interior space based on the public ways of dwelling? Yes. Um... I want to highlight that, yes, we are activists. <laughs> and uh, we do not believe that public space should have different values than private space. For us, the common, the common value is that life is the most important thing. Um, for that, uh, we have to think about care from the point of view of uh, co-responsibility. Um, so for us, it's very important uh, breaking down the hierarchies in public and in private space. And also uh, for us, it, it, we don't have to assign specific activities to each, each space because as we have seen, um, we care is a value that we, that traditionally we attribute to, attribute to private space, but we care in public space. So we need uh, infrastructure and we need a lot of things to, to support all these activities. And I think that in this context of a global COVID pandemic uh, has been very clear that all of us, we are vulnerable and we need um, health services, but also has been very clear that we need social relations and that we need the mutual aid of other people. And this is possible if we have a kind of city uh, who, which is purifying uh, care. Thank you. So, uh, if uh, as we are really facing the, the, the end of our discussion because uh, the time is uh, going. I think that we can also mention something that um, at, the, at the beginning of yesterday's uh, of yesterday, we had a talk about the new European Bauhaus initiative. And it seems that all of your, of your uh, proposals somehow fit into this initiative with the inclusivity with the participation processes and also with this uh, kind of ecological uh, um, point of view and uh, rehabilitation of nature. So um, it seems that um, young creatives and uh, creative uh, emerging creatives uh, are very much uh, aware of the situation that the world uh, is in. So I think that that is also very important and that uh, we are really faced with the uh, with, um, changing planets, changing way of living mm -hmm. and uh, 
complete and that we have to be aware of uh, how to, to model and how to build or rebuild or reuse the world that we are living. Mm -hmm. And of course, to be very much uh, um, aware of, of, of the importance of being uh, responsible for, for, the, for the planet that we all inhabit. And you, Manuel, do you have some comments for, for the end of this discussion? <laughs> Well, we, we, I, just, I just got a message that we have 10 more minutes because oh. we, we started later. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to add on what you just said that we, ha we still have a few questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. So when you address these comments on what Nanita just uh, mentioned, you could also add the questions that are addressed to you. There is one to, to Blanca, a very specific one, and another one to Hannah. So uh, you can read them because the audience don't see the chat. So you can read them before you reply. And this is just to add on the comment of the... Okay, so there is a, the question I received, I think the one from Tonya is, um, how does uh, the work communicate with the public beyond the personal experience it gives uh, to me as an author? Um, and, and I think that's a, a, a really, you know, good point because I'm talking about something extremely specific, like the design of the packaging of a medication I was on for a short period of time. Um, and I think like through the filmmaking and, and through my essay writing and, and lecturing and, and where I have a chance to kind of expand upon uh, the ideas, uh, I do uh, strive to, to, to go into the very specific and personal and then have that open up larger questions and i think when it comes to chronic illness and it comes to disability um you know it is uh, a topic that has not gained as much uh attention as um other areas of activism such as uh feminism um, such as, as race, we talk about diversity in, in the field and also in obviously in architecture, it, it is important that that notion of diversity uh, includes um, a lot of different experiences. Uh, and it was interesting for me as well when I uh, approached uh, Architecture Beyond Sight, that, that project, uh, that I didn't personally have um, uh, experience of, of living with um, visual impairment uh, and I was hired as a filmmaker which is very much a visual medium so that posed a challenge to me when I started thinking about okay what is it about this this idea of the bodies just that doesn't fit a norm that that could inform uh, the way we think about spaces and, and, and buildings and cities and I think um, some of those discussion that came from that, uh, it does have to do with uh, playing on uh, the whole kind of uh, array of senses that we have uh, and also not being worried that, you know, our bodies don't fit the norm, uh, uh, actually, all of us. And the fact that we all, uh, we do live longer today than we have in the past. And we live with more chronic illness and, and also temporary illness. If you break your leg, you'll also notice that stairs aren't uh, very accessible, for example. So um, at least that's that's what I'm attempting with my work. And I hope that this will result in a, in a publication maybe or an exhibition or something that can, can use those very personal experience and details to, to say something about uh, a greater issue in society and, and architectural culture. Now, I would just add that you said that our, when our bodies don't fit the norm, and I would just add that our bodies and our mind don't fit the norm, because it's often not only a question of physicality, but the way we think space and we think how to relate with others and those imperatives, how do you say this in English? Yeah. Often also mind mind related and that, that's very that's very interesting and i think it would, it would lead us to a 
to a longer discussion, but it's, it's a very good start. There is also a question to, to Blanca. I, I, can, yeah. I can read it out. It's yeah, uh, about, about the, um... intergenerational participatory work for the future landscapes of care. How important is the connection of different generations in public spaces? Yeah, thank you. Um, for us, it's very important to include the inter intergenerational participatory work because people's experience, perception, and needs change over the years with our life cycle. So it is very important to include this diversity to make a space that are um, socially fair. And I want to, to uh, explain an example <laughs> that also explain why we are very obsessed with benches. And it's because uh, my father has Parkinson um, ha, well, for many years. Uh, he has been uh, sick. So the health center is like so seven minutes uh, from my house to to my to my parents' house to the to the health uh, health service center is seven minutes, but in this journey uh, there are not benches, so he cannot do this journey along with my mother together because there are not benches. So a uh, very easy uh, infrastructure like a benches, uh, like a bench, um, allow us or allow uh, elderly people uh, be uh, more or less independent and autonomous in the, in the city, no? So for example, uh, this is a, for me a very clear example, uh, like the needs that we have changed uh, along the years, no? because uh, 10 years ago, this is something that he doesn't need. No? So uh, it's very important um, to people from different ages speak together also, because it's important in the city that people understand the needs to another people, um, yeah. There's also the, I don't know if you mentioned already this, it's a, I think it's more rather a comment. It's interesting because there are three expressions of social problems that are usually conceived separately, but that belong to a totality. I think the complicated thing is to understand them together how could they be compatible or where do they differ in practice? Maybe this was a comment when we were, I mean, I, I feel a bit lost within all that we spoke. I don't know if you can track where we were when this comment were, was inserted. And if you want to, any of you want to go on. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we have two minutes for this. Who wants to grab those two minutes? Any of you? Which is actually quite related probably to the European Bauhaus and the, the three the three main keywords that Xavier told us yesterday, the aesthetics, inclusivity, and what was the third one? Transformation. Which is probably the most important one. Transformation. Sorry? Transformation. Exactly. <laughs> yes, but this is all the kind, all, all that we mentioned is the way of transforming the space, transforming the architecture, or the will to transform it, or how to, to, to think it or rethink it differently, how to transform the, the nature, how to transform the city with, the, with certain uh, benches or some kind of, of uh, urban furniture or whatever that is needed for different generations also, or, or how to, to transform the, the interiors and exteriors uh, in, 
bearing in mind needs of people who have some kind of chronic chronic uh, status uh, illness or not, or not just illness but something like that so uh, i think that we are all talking about transformation in a way <laughs> Do you agree? Yeah, and, oh, sorry, I just wanted to uh, jump in and say also about the, your, your, your project uh, OAC. Uh, it was really striking as well with the river, you know, that doesn't fit. <laughs> it kind of just comes in and flows at, as, as it will. So that made me think about as well about other, other things that uh, impacts architecture that doesn't kind of fit. Uh, what might have been designed for it, but I think in your project it comes like it, it, it's allowed to to live freely. You know? There is another new message. Well, there is this there is this question from Gabriela mm -hmm. uh, from Cocina Salterinas. Uh, I, I'll, I'll read it, but I think we also have to go to the main session. But I'll, I'll just read it, and maybe we, it can stay in the air. I really love how the three projects map the evolution of heritage and even challenge the traditional way of approaching to it by focusing into the body, political and human. And then there's a question that we will probably not answer, but if you could choose one element of your project to preserve in history, what would it be? Shortly. <laughs> three words. <laughs> Very fast. And then we have to move. Blanca. What would yeah, you for me, it's only a sentence and it's a reivindication. And my reivindication is care must be in the center of urban decision. Well, for us, the, the main important thing to preserve in history is the, the same river, because we are returning um, the space that belongs to the river to itself. So I think the most important is to preserve. And the river was before us and must be after us. Okay. And then you? Um... Yeah, I think, I think uh, with preserve, I really like this uh, uh, firsthand accounts by, by other patients uh, about how they describe their body changing in a specific building or how they remember uh, walking on surfaces or using the building, I think to me that's incredibly uh, rich and exciting. Memory of the body. <laughs> okay, so thank you all. It was really a pleasure. And uh, we wish you all the best for, for the coming projects within the platform. And uh, we'll see what's going to happen during this year. So, Manuel, some final words on your side? Well, I think, yeah, we just, it, it was wonderful to hear you all. And I think we should now move to the main session. And thank you all to the, also to the, those fellows and members that are still in the session here in the uh, Zoom session. And to all the audience that was following us in the public session. Bye. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye.